그후 유대인의 명절이 되어 예수님은 예루살렘으로 올라가셨다. 예루살렘 양문 곁에는 히브리 말로 베데스라는 곳이 있고 그 둘레에는 행각 다섯 채가 서 있었다. 이 행각에는 만 환자 소경 절뚝박이 말이 손발이 마비된 사람들이 질비하게 누워 있었다. 그 못에는 가끔 천사가 내려와 물을 휘저 놓고 나는데 물을 휘저 놓은 다음에 제일 먼저 들어간 사람은 무슨 병이든지 다 나았다. 그런데 거기에 38년 동안 앓고 있는 환자가 있었다. 예수님은 그가 누워 있는 것을 보시자 병이 벌써 오래된 줄 아시고 그에게 내가 낫고 싶으냐 하고 물으셨다. 그러자 그 환자는 선생님 물이 움직일 때 나를 못에 넣어주는 사람이 없어 내가 가는 동안에 다른 사람이 먼저 들어갑니다 하고 대답하였다. 그때 예수님이 일어나 내 자리를 들고 걸어가라 하시자 그는 곧 병이 나 자리를 걷어들고 걸어갔다. 그런데 그날은 안식일이었다. 요한복음 5장 1절에서 9절 말씀입니다. After this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids blind lame and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Once again, good morning, church. I'm glad that all of you are able to join us today. We're going to begin this next part of our service with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us the ability to continue worshiping together, even though we're spread apart in different places. And Lord, I just pray that today... Your spirit would be with us to unify us, to draw us together, to pour your love and your joy through us so that we would truly be able to worship you and meditate on your word together in spirit. And Heavenly Father, I pray also that during this troubling time that you would give us the wisdom that we need to know how best to serve each other. Lord, I pray that you'd fill our hearts with compassion and love for one another. And Lord, I pray that as we look into your word this morning, that you'd help us to understand clearly. Help me to speak your word clearly and faithfully as well. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with us today and that the meditations that we have upon your word would be glorifying to you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. In English, sometimes we say that no good deed goes unpunished. Now, I know that's kind of a pessimistic thing to say, uh, but it's something that we tend to say that whenever someone has done something that they, that they thought was going to be a good thing and people were going to be happy about it, but people were not happy about it at all. Um, the reason I, I mention that phrase is that it seems to be the case for Jesus in John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, the story begins with a man whose physical condition made him so weak that he was unable to move well on his own. And so he was, the day that he met Jesus, he was laying at a pool, as we've just read in the scriptures, next to one of the gates in Jerusalem, because there was this legend about people being healed in that water. Well, Jesus found the man there and asked him an astonishing question. He said, do you want to be healed? You might be thinking, well, what kind of question is that? Well, I think what Jesus was doing here was kind of in a roundabout way, um, kind of preaching the gospel to this man because Jesus is the only one who can heal him. It's not gonna, his healing is not going to come from this pool when the water gets stirred up. It's going to come from God. So the man answered him in the way that he understood to answer that no one was helping him get into that healing pool. Well, Jesus didn't bring him into that pool either. Instead, The man had to be shown that Jesus alone had that power. 
And so Jesus says to him, get up, take your bed, and walk. And immediately the man's weakness left him, and he became strong and healthy, and he was able to stand up and pick up his bed and go on his way. He looked for Jesus, but Jesus was already already gone. And the end of verse 9 tells us that this event happened on the Sabbath, on the day for rest. So on the Sabbath, the Sabbath was the one day a week that God commanded his people not to work. It was kind of like a mandatory holiday. And by Jesus' time, the Jewish religious authorities had defined 39 different broad categories of work which were prohibited on the Sabbath. 39 different things that you are not supposed to do in order to be able to say that you rested on the Sabbath. And one of those things was carrying something. So if you were carrying something, you were working and therefore breaking the Sabbath. So we move on to verses 10 through 12, John chapter 5, 10 through 12. It says, so the Jews, now when we're saying the Jews here, we're talking about the Jewish religious leaders, said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? This part of the story is so striking to me. Because the response of these religious leaders, they, they respond to, I mean, a, a miracle happened. This man, they, they saw him and they, they didn't think about, he's, he's been lame for 38 years. He's been able to walk unable to walk for all of this time, and now here he is walking. Yeah, it's a Sabbath day, and he's carrying his mat, but he was walking now when he could not walk before. But do they see any of that? No, they don't see that at all. All they see is that someone is working on the Sabbath. Someone is breaking a rule. They did not marvel at the amazing thing that happened. They didn't even try to investigate now, all they could see was that someone had told this man to carry his bed on the Sabbath. And such a rule breaker had to be stopped. Now, later on, Jesus caught up with the man at the temple and told him to sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Now, the man's sin was a bigger problem than his illness, and that's what Jesus is talking about here. That the worst thing that could happen to the man was not another round of sickness. The worst thing that could happen would be to fall under the judgment of God if he persisted in sin. And later on, as we read through this passage, we're going to find out more about, about that because, well, Jesus is the one who has authority to judge. The man promptly told the Jewish leaders about Jesus because they'd asked him to. Um, I don't know what his motives were, but I think... Um, I like to think that he was just being an honest witness. They asked me who told me to take up my, my bed and walk. Well, he came and talked to me. I'm going to go and tell them. So when confronted, though, Jesus answered them in reference to this Sabbath law. It says, in this way, the Jews, this is verses 16 to 18, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Amazing, isn't it? Instead of thinking through the connection of this miraculous thing that had happened, and the teacher who claimed that God was his father, the teacher who told this lame man after 38 years to stand up and walk. What is their response to Jesus? Well, they want to kill him now because he's not just breaking the Sabbath, now he's blaspheming. The Jewish leader's problem was that they were so obsessed with their strict interpretation of the law that they failed to see who that law pointed to. Jesus, the Messiah, 
the Son of God, was standing right in front of them, and they accused him of breaking the Sabbath? He made the Sabbath. They accused him of blasphemy. He is who he says he is. But this is where a very important question, I think, is raised for us today. And this is, this is the big question that I want us to, to ponder and think about as we move through the rest of this sermon. That is, how do we avoid that mistake? How do we diligently obey God as we should do without losing sight of Christ? It's so easy for us to lean too far in one direction or another. And what I mean is that there are, there are Christians today who are so obsessed with keeping the rules of, of being a good Christian that they overlook their relationship with Jesus. When that happens, we can, we can have this misplaced confidence in our own holiness. It can cause us to look down on other people. I think even worse than that, though, this, this kind of over-focus on the law and, and, uh, and doing good and, and making sure we follow all the rules while we overlook Jesus who saved us, it can lead a lot of Christians to despair when we realize that we're not living up to God's standards despite our best efforts. I think the other way that people lean toward is ignoring God's rules altogether, ignoring the law altogether. And this is also problematic because by doing so, we ignore the very thing that points us to Jesus. And on top of that, God is holy and he's called us to be holy too. So how do we do this? How do we, how do we diligently obey God without losing sight of Christ, the one who has saved us by his death on the cross and given us his grace? Today we're on the fifth part of our series on the Gospel of John. And what we find in John is that this Gospel is uniquely reflective and theological. So as, as we move through this Gospel, we find that, that there are these stories, and of the, these accounts of what Jesus did, and then there's a lot more of Jesus' words, his, his dialogue, regarding these things. And what that gives us is a deeper insight into what's going on below the surface, behind the curtain. We get a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and what he came to do. And so we're reading through this. We're working through this, um, <clears throat> this Gospel of John. And we're, we're, we're presented with this unique opportunity to think along with John about who Jesus is, to experience him in a deeper and richer way. In this series, we're focusing on this on, what, on who Jesus is and what he came to do and how this is good news for us today. And what we find in John chapter 5 is Jesus' response to the Jewish authorities shows us that we can only obey God by keeping Christ in sight. We can only obey God when we keep Jesus in the center of our focus. It takes us away from just trying to follow rules to get ourselves saved. No, we have to focus on Jesus, keep our, keep our eyes on him, and then we can obey God. Now the story, it really plays out kind of like a courtroom drama. Jesus healed a man, so this is the incident, and this man was later caught carrying his bed on the Sabbath. So that, that's the incident, that's a thing that happens. Now, the investigation of this incident by the Jewish authorities led to the discovery that Jesus not only instructed him to carry his bed, but justified himself by calling God his Father. And so these authorities now accuse Jesus of breaking the Sabbath and of blasphemy. And the rest of the chapter is Jesus' defense. He defends himself by arguing his case, by calling witnesses, and then by making a counter-accusation. In his argument, Jesus first addressed the charge of making himself equal with God. 
And as he does this, what we learn from this is that eternal life is received only by faith in the Son of God. Okay, so let's have a look now at verses 19 to 24. Jesus said to them, so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Son does, that, uh, sorry, for whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Okay, so Jesus' argument here is basically that he did not make himself equal with God, but he is the Son of God. And as the Son of God, he does not act independently of God. Rather, he does what his Father does. Now, this is where we get a little bit of uh, Trinitarian theology going on here, and it's a little bit difficult to wrap our heads around. But I think what's going on here is that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit can be thought of as the same Essence of God expressed in three persons, like three personal roles. And within these roles, there is a hierarchy such that the Son, though equal with the Father, submits to him. And likewise, the Spirit, though equal with the Father and the Son, submits to the Son. This is the first part of Jesus' justification for healing the man on the Sabbath. He was doing the work of his Father. So he's doing the will of God because he's the son of God. He'd been given all authority to judge as well. And so in other words, Jesus has the power to give life because God has the power to give life. And he has the authority to to choose whom to give it to and when because as the son of God, he has been given that authority. And so then in the following verses, Jesus expands this argument to show his authority even in the final judgment. So in, in, in before, he's, he's telling them, well, this is why I healed the man, because I have the authority to give this man life. I'm doing what my father does. And now he's going to expand that out. Verses 25 to 29. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when, I love this part, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. As the Son of God, Jesus has life in himself and he has all authority over judgment. As the Son of Man, Jesus has received authority to call humanity out of the grave and carry out that judgment. So I think what we learn from this is that we, we actually we cannot obey God without our attention focused on who Jesus is. He's the one who has the authority to give us life or to judge us. It's his word that we have to hear and believe if we want to receive eternal life. And so if Jesus wants to heal someone on the Sabbath day and tell that man to get up and pick his bed and walk, he can do that. That's his authority. And and it's that Son of God that we have to look to to receive eternal life. So it's Jesus that we have to be focused on in order to obey God. Because that was the big question, right? The, 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 
Jewish authorities were against him because they thought he wasn't obeying God. Now, in the second part of his defense, Jesus called three witnesses to prove his claim to be the Son of God. And what we're going to find here, then, is that prophets and miracles and scriptures are all meant to, all designed to point towards that Son of God, to point towards Jesus. <clears throat> this is uh, verses 31 to 40, a little bit long. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not deemed true. He's, he's talking in a courtroom sort of way here, right? So you, if you have one witness to something, that's not usually good enough to stand up in court, especially in Jewish law. Um, you needed two witnesses or more. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. These are his accusers, right? And he's saying these to them so that they may be saved. He, he verse 35, was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So you catch that? That's, that's two witnesses so far. John the Baptist and the mighty works that he's doing. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, third witness. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. <clears throat> so Jesus starts here with the testimony of John the Baptist. And, and we read about that in the first chapter of, <clears throat> of John's Gospel. John the Baptist came out and testified, and, and he kept proclaiming whenever he saw Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, Jesus started with John the Baptist because most of the people at that time actually did consider him to be a prophet. They, they believed that he was a real prophet. He was actually speaking the words of God. And so then, if the Jewish authorities in this situation, if they denied that Jesus is the Son of God, they would also have to deny that John was a prophet. And that would be difficult because even some of the Pharisees went down to John to get baptized. So Jesus calls John the Baptist as a witness. Secondly, Jesus calls on the testimony of the mighty works that he's been doing. That's, that's the miracles. So when he turned water into, into wine, when he healed the official son, and now when he's, he's taken this lame man and made him able, able to walk, and there's other miracles as well that aren't recorded, recorded in John's gospel that we see elsewhere. As Nicodemus said in chapter 3, he said, We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus could not have made this man who had been lame for 38 years stand up and walk again unless God was working through him. And so Jesus takes us a step further by saying that God himself is now bearing witness to Jesus through the amazing things that he did. Look, this is showing you that God approves of me. And specifically, in this case, Jesus' healing of the man at the pool clearly testified that he is the Son of God. So by accusing him, instead of recognizing the testimony of God about his Son, these religious leaders were showing that they did not really know God. And Jesus then called on the scriptures as his final witness. This is kind of like a, a surprise witness at the end of the courtroom drama because the religious leaders made it their business to know every line of scripture. They believed that this was the way to life. And in part, they were right. That in order to get to, in order to understand God's character, in order to come into his presence, in order to, in order to know the one whom he was sending into the world, they had to go through the scriptures. How ironic 
Jesus says, that they would not receive life from the one whom the scriptures pointed to. And this is where we also start to hear the beginning of Jesus' counter-accusation of these religious leaders. Verses 41 to 43. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how would you believe my words? The accusation is that they neither have God's word nor God's love in them. And I think that's a really, it's really important for us to think about that. Because they, they saw this man who had been lame for 38 years, carrying his bed. And all they could think about was that he broke the Sabbath rules. Where's the love? Where's the compassion? See, if, they, if, if God's word was in them, they would know that God wrote all of his laws. He gave all of his laws through Moses because of his, his steadfast love. That's what God says of himself when he's passing in front of Moses in, in, on that time on top of the mountaintop. He calls out his own name, the Lord, the Lord, with his steadfast love to thousands of generations. That's who God is. But they missed that. They were concerned only with the rules and regulations. They missed the character of God, the love of God that was shown through these. The purpose of the Sabbath not, was not to, to catch people out and make sure they were following the rules. The purpose of the Sabbath was to give people rest. And now this man, he finally had rest from his illness. They did not have God's love in them. They failed to receive the one whom God had sent. They sought glory from people rather than glory, rather than the glory of God. That is, they wanted people to look at them and say, look, I see, you know, see how, how well I am keeping all the rules. See how holy I am. But when the glory of God is standing there in front of them, they're not seeking this at all. Their failure to believe in Jesus betrayed their failure to believe the scriptures. Their legalism had led them away from life in Christ instead of toward it. So let's come back to our initial question. How do we obey God without losing sight of Christ? The answer to that, I think, begins with realizing that life is only received by faith in Jesus. That's what he says back in, back in this passage. Whoever believes in me will have eternal life. We're never going to gain life by keeping or enforcing rules. We have to realize, we also have to realize that the value of Scripture is that it reveals God's character to us. And its purpose is to point us to Christ. And so when, when we're looking at all the different rules that we have to follow, which are important, it's very important to try to try to do God's will, try to live the way that he wants us to live. But we can't do it for the wrong reason. We can't do it be just for the sake of the rules themselves. We do it because this is God's character. And we do it because it's pointing us towards Christ. We cannot obey God 
unless we're focused on Jesus. Now, the irony is that so often we get stuck on the very things that are testifying to the glory of Jesus. So often, Christians will glorify a prophet or a preacher or a theologian and forget about Christ, who's, who these witnesses are desperately trying to show us. We, we, we choose our favorite author. We choose our favorite preacher. And we stand in awe of them instead of in awe of Christ. We get caught up sometimes. Some of us get caught up in the awe of, of signs and wonders. And so then we, we start to put our hope in my miracle, completely forgetting that the whole purpose of any miracle is to bear witness to the glory of Christ, to inspire faith in Jesus. And then seemingly on the opposite end of that spectrum, and I think most ironic of all, are those among us who end up worshiping Scripture instead of Jesus. Now, nobody thinks about it like that. But whenever we become more concerned with splitting theological hairs than the glory of God, then we've misunderstood the purpose of Scripture. Whenever we become obsessed with keeping rules and trying to be good Christians, we've lost sight of our need for the grace that only comes by faith in Jesus. So what are we to do practically? Well, I would say listen to and read the great Christian teachers. That's good. Be in awe of God's mighty power when he does amazing things. Search and meditate on the scriptures. Learn to obey and to live the way that God wants us to live. But look where all these witnesses are pointing. Because life is not found in the prophets. Life is not found in the miracles or even in scripture. Life is found in Christ. Believe scripture because it drives us to Jesus. Believe Jesus because he alone gives us eternal life. We can only truly obey God if our whole focus is on the one whom he has sent, Jesus, who died in our place. Because the fact is we can't obey scripture as well as we want to. Every single one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, if we're honest with ourselves, we have to recognize and realize that, okay, even if I try to keep all the rules, I'm going to fail. I can't obey God without focus on Jesus. And particularly, if you think about this in a broad theological sort of way, there is now, since Jesus has come, there is now only one command. That if we fail to obey that one command, we'll find ourselves on the wrong end of God's judgment. And that is the command to believe in the one whom he has sent. Kind of a paradigm shift, isn't it? So then, what, what sin can send me to hell? Failing to believe in Jesus. Does that mean that I can, I can just live however I want now, as long as I've got my faith? No, absolutely not. Because he's changing us and he's making us into the people he wants us to be. We obey God by focusing and having our faith set firmly in Jesus. Let's pray. Hey, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you reveal yourself to us in your word. We thank you so much that you show us the way to salvation in your word. And we thank you so much that in your word you, you teach us how to honor you, how to serve you, and how to obey you. But Heavenly Father, I just pray that, that every one of us, as we search your word, as we think about it, as we strive to live the way that you want us to live, that we would always do so with Christ in focus. Knowing that apart from faith in him, we are lost. 
Heavenly Father, I pray that you would fill us with the joy of knowing you. That as we seek you, as we seek you, that we would learn your character. We would learn your love. And through your spirit, we would be able to apply your loving character in every aspect of our lives. Heavenly Father, I pray these things in Jesus' name.